Welcome back to BE 110. We'll continue our discussion of the constitutive equation by examining the equations for a linearly elastic or Hookean solid. Elastic solids have the following characteristics. First, they should have a unique unloaded natural state to which they return when all the stresses are removed. And the stress depends only on the strain in the material. More generally, as a result of this, we can say that elastic solids store all the work that's done by the stresses in deforming them as potential energy, or sometimes we call it strain energy. And this energy is released when the stresses are removed. Thus, the deformation of an elastic solid is a th thermodynamically reversible process. And we can conclude from this that the stress in an elastic solid is independent of the path or history of the strain. In other words, it doesn't matter how the strain state was achieved, only what the strain state is, that's the only determinant of the stress in the elastic material. And the process of loading and unloading a material is reversible so that all the work done on the material is stored in it and then it's all released when the material is unloaded. Elasticity is very useful idealization. For many materials, especially engineering materials, the strains that they experience under normal design or working conditions is very low. And so under these lows, the stress-strain relationship is linear. And we can use the Cauchy infinitesimal strain. Imagine we have a specimen subjected to uniaxial tension or compression with a cross-sectional area A so that the uniaxial tensile or compressive stress sigma xx is F over A. And the length is L and so the strain is delta L divided by L. If we plot the stress versus strain in a linearly elastic solid, we get a straight line for tension and compression within a certain range, and the slope of that straight line is called the Young's modulus, and it's a measure of the elastic stiffness of the material. At some point, if we stre stretch the material beyond a certain point, uh, the material becomes anelastic. This is called the elastic limit, and in the case of a ductile material, the elastic limit would be the yield point at which the material becomes plastic and uh, starts to deform irreversibly, such that when we unload it, it doesn't return to its original length. In a brittle material, the elastic limit may correspond with the point at which the material starts to fracture and, and fail. Another experiment that can be done in a linearly elastic material is to measure the ratio of the transverse strain components, for example, EZZ or EYY in this direction, in proportion to strain in the longitudinal or loaded direction, in this case, EXX. In a linearly elastic material, and we see this in, in many engineering materials for small strains, the strain in the transverse direction is linearly proportional to the strain in the longitudinal direction. It's, in the, it's of the opposite sign, so if we're stretching the sample in this direction, then it'll shrink in the other direction. And that ratio of the negative shrinkage strain to the positive tensile strain is called the Poisson ratio, and uh, is typically about 0.3 or 0.4 in many engineering materials. These two technical constants, E the Young's modulus and nu the Poisson ratio, can both be measured at the same time in a single uniaxial tension test. And if the material is isotropic, meaning that had we done that same test from a sample of the material cut from any other orientation, we would have got the same result, then in fact these two constants, the Young's modulus and the Poisson ratio, turn out to be sufficient to completely define the properties of an isotropic Hookean elastic solid. Now, it's important to realize, as we've pointed out before, that the context of the 
of the loading, not just the material itself, determine the accuracy of the assumption of linear elasticity. You can see that in linearly elastic materials, this approximation holds well, but for small strains, typically considerably less than 1%. Beyond those small strains, we reach the elastic limit, and not only is the stress-strain behavior not linear, it also quickly it becomes non-elastic. So neither the assumption of linear linearity or elasticity will be valid above a certain uh, loading. So with that background, let's derive Hooke's law for a continuum. In a linearly elastic Hookean solid, the stress is linearly proportional to the Cauchy infinitesimal strain. So we can write that the components of the stress tensor Tij equals Cijkl times epsilon kl, where Cijkl are the components of the fourth order tensor of elastic constants. Just as we reasoned for the linear viscous fluid, this tensor has a total of 3 to the 4 or 81 components. However, because of the symmetry of the stress Tij and the strain epsilon kl, the number of independent constants would reduce from 81 to 36, which I think of as the number of constants in a 6 by 6 matrix relating the 6 com independent components of the stress tensor to the 6 independent components of the strain tensor. However, we can actually do better than that. If you recall from conservation of energy, that the rate of work done by the stresses was given by the product Tij deij, or the trace of the product of the stress tensor with the rate of deformation tensor. Now recall that the rate of deform deformation tensor dij is also the strain rate or epsilon ij dot or d epsilon ij dt. So from this we can write dw dt equals tij d epsilon ij or dw equals tij d epsilon ij and now we can integrate this substitute cij kl times epsilon kl for tij integrate with respect to epsilon ij and we'll get one half CIJKL epsilon IJ epsilon KL. Now if we see that this expression would be same if we switched the order of uh, epsilon IJ here and epsilon KL here, which means that we should be able to switch the order of uh, IJ here and KL here in this expression. And that leads us to the conclusion that CIJKL equals CKLIJ. So this additional symmetry further reduces the number of independent constants from 36 to 21. So you can think again of that 6 by 6 matrix relating the 6 independent components of the stress to the 6 independent components of the strain, but now that's actually a symmetric matrix. So this reasoning is also true for the uh, viscosity tensor Bijkl that we uh, derived for linear viscous fluids. But as with Newtonian viscous fluids, to simplify any further, we need to consider the material symmetry. Unlike fluids, many material symmetries are possible in solids. It's easy to imagine and think of solids that have different properties in different directions like muscle has different direction properties along its fiber orientations, so do tendons and ligaments and other fibrous connective tissues. The simplest material symmetry is isotropy. So just as we did before for the Newtonian viscous fluid, we can write down a general form for an isotropic fourth order tensor, one that also satisfies the symmetry conditions 
that we just derived based on the symmetry of the stress and the strain and on the conservation of energy. So as we saw for the linear viscous fluid, we also see that the general isotropic expression has two material constants, lambda and mu. So we get Cijkl equals lambda times delta Ij delta Kl plus mu times delta Ik delta Jl plus delta Il delta Jk. Now substituting this into our linear expression for the stress-strain relation, we get we get Tij equals Cijkl times epsilon Kl is equal to lambda times delta Ij delta Kl epsilon Kl plus mu times delta Ik delta Jl times epsilon Kl plus mu times delta Il delta Jk epsilon Kl. And now we can see that these expressions simplify, so we get Tij equals lambda times delta Ij and delta KL epsilon KL is epsilon KK, this KL turns this L into a K. Delta IK delta JL times epsilon KL becomes epsilon IJ, K becomes an I, L becomes a J, and similarly delta IL delta JK times epsilon KL becomes an epsilon JI. Since epsilon IJ equals epsilon JI, because it's symmetric, symmetric we get lambda delta ij epsilon kk plus 2 mu eij. Or writing this in direct notation, the stress in an isotropic Hookian elastic solid is lambda times the trace of e times i the identity tensor plus 2 mu times epsilon. So this is Hooke's law for an isotropic elastic solid. Lambda and mu are elastic moduli that are known as the Lame constants. Since strain is dimensionless, they have the same units as stress has. We can find the Lame constants in terms of uh, technical constants such as the Young's modulus and Poisson ratio, and we'll do that next time. Writing the constitutive law out now in full for the isotropic Hookean elastic solid, we get the following. T11 is equal to lambda times epsilon 1 1 plus epsilon 2 2 plus epsilon 3 3 so that's the trace of E T 2 2 equals lambda times epsilon 1 1 plus epsilon 2 2 plus epsilon 3 3 plus 2 mu epsilon 2 2 and T 3 3 equals lambda times epsilon 1 1 plus epsilon 2 2 plus epsilon 3 3 plus 2 mu times epsilon 3 3 and then the shear stress components, T23 is 2 mu times epsilon 2,3. T13 is 2 mu times epsilon 1,3. And T12 is 2 mu times epsilon 1,2. So you can see here that the, the modulus mu directly relates the shear stress to the shear strain. It's known as the shear modulus and often denoted by G which is another technical constant. So next time we'll actually derive the relationship between lambda and mu and the technical constants E and nu.